Consider Cannabis is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment recommendations. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The value of proper endocannabinoid tone within the body appears to play a significant role in maintaining the general physiological and emotional well-being of a person. It's time to consider cannabis. I'm your host, Curtis. This is the 23rd episode of Consider Cannabis. Last time, we spoke to Chad Thompson and Priscilla Harris of the Sensible Movement Coalition, who shared some details about their work, as well as some hints at big news coming June 19th during Lobby Day at the State House in Columbus. We have no guests this week, and I've taken a good bit of time preparing this episode for your consideration. Today, we're going to explore some of the known history of cannabis and its uses through the ages starting at around 12,000 BCE, and then we're going to go up through to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. Then we're going to take a look at what the endocannabinoid system is, how it functions, and what it does that we know of so far in our body. In preparation for this episode, I read and reread and reread again from Michael Backus' book, Cannabis Pharmacy, the updated and revised version. I reached out to Mr. Backus on Facebook, requesting an interview, but we never heard back. Perhaps the release of this episode will catch his attention in a positive way. And if you're listening, we'd love to have you on the show. Now, as I've shared in the past, I went to Ohio Marijuana Card to get my recommendation. I saw a Dr. Tim Thress, who looked at my medical records, gave me a treatment recommendation. We talked about terpenes and strains. And at the end of the visit, he recommended this book to me and told me that if I really wanted to learn about this medicine and the best way to use it, to buy cannabis pharmacy and make sure it's the updated version. Now this book isn't required reading for doctors. I've heard it is for some bud titters, but that's something I just remember from a past conversation. Regardless, I highly recommend this book to everyone considering cannabis as a treatment option. Now it's broken up into four parts. Part one, cannabis as a medicine. Part two, using medical cannabis. Part three, varieties of medical cannabis. And part four, medical uses of cannabis, where they go into 50 specific diagnoses, like Parkinson's disease, for example where they discuss the historical uses, the effectiveness, they discuss how they believe cannabis interacts with the body to effectively treat that disease. They also give beginning dosage recommendations and suggested methods of ingestion. But today we're just gonna stick with part one. So let's dive in and consider cannabis together. Now it's believed that humans have grown and cultivated cannabis and perhaps even use it for its medicinal and intoxicating effects since the end of the last ice age, some 12,000 BCE. The earliest physical evidence of cannabis use comes from a 10,200 year old dried cannabis seed found in a clay jar on the island of Okinoshima, located on the west side of southern Japan. But there's also a needle of the cave painting discovered in Japan from that time that one researcher believes depicts waves, horses, and people between what could be interpreted as, quote, tall stalks with hemp-shaped leaves, end quote. Now, you have to check this picture out on page 12 yourself. I'll try to find a picture and post it on the website, but I'll be honest, the skeptic in me isn't really buying it. It looks like two sand dollars on poles more than a cannabis plant to me, but who am I to judge ancient artists? Anyway, it's widely believed that cannabis is to have moved across Eurasia around 5,000 years ago by the same route that would become the Silk Road. And residue from a charred cannabis seed found in Romania from that time has led many people to believe that cannabis was used in Bronze Age funeral rituals. But the first account of cannabis being used specifically as medicine is from China some 4,700 years ago. In the writings of Xin Yun, cannabis, ginseng, and ephedra are all listed as important herbal remedies. And by the first century CE, cannabis covered over 100 ailments in China's oral tradition of medicine and was incorporated in their first pharmacopoeia. So cannabis was used as a medicine in the Mediterranean region from 1500 to 200 BCE in Egypt, Greece, and India. And it is found in an ancient Persian religious text from that time as well. Polish anthropologist Sula Bennett, who studied Polish and Judaic customs and traditions, has claimed cannabis as an original ingredient in Hebrew's holy anointing oil described in the book of Exodus. Though the word she used to translate as cannabis was replaced when the Old Testament was translated into the Greek Septuagint. Somewhere between 865 and 925 CE, cannabis was proclaimed to be a good remedy by Persian physician Muhammad E. Zahariya Yivrazi. While in the 10th century, physician Ibn Washia, in his book On Poison, claimed that just the smell of cannabis resin would kill you within days of exposure. 
Very little was written about cannabis as medicine in Western literature in the 17th century. However, Robert Burton, an English scholar, included hemp seed in a long list of herbal remedies for depression, as did herbalist Nicholas Culpepper, an English physician. And it should be noted that both of these were referring to the fibrous varieties of cannabis and would have been non-intoxicating medicine. William O'Shaughnessy, an Irish physician working in India, led to the reemergence of cannabis indica in Western medicine. Here, O'Shaughnessy looked at cannabis as both a medicine and an intoxicant, which locally wasn't usually smoked, but rather consumed in a drink called banglasi, which often called for as much as one ounce of cannabis flower and leaves, which could have delivered up to 200 milligrams of THC per cup. O'Shaughnessy's work in India caught the attention of Europe, where it was studied for about 50 years, and by 1887, Raphael Valeri touted the benefits of hemp as an alternative to O'Shaughnessy's intoxicating beverage, marking the first time mankind has observed scientific evidence that high CBD, low THC had beneficial therapeutic value. In 1890, J.R. Reynolds, Queen Victoria's personal physician, wrote, quote, In almost all painful maladies, I have found Indian hemp by far the most useful of drugs, end quote, which was published in the widely respected British medical journal The Lancet. In 1894, the British government published the Indian Hemp Drug Commission Report, a study that focused only on the fibrous cannabis variety, and it concluded, quote, The commission have now examined all the evidence before them regarding the effects attributed to hemp drugs. It has been clearly established that the occasional use of hemp in moderate doses may be beneficial, but this use may be regarded as medicinal in character. Then in 1895, the medical and surgical reporter published an editorial which emphasized the safety of cannabis, citing specifically that there had never been a poisoning death attributed to cannabis. And in 1925, things turned. The International Opium Convention was ratified by the League of Nations, and this included language that effectively banned cannabis and its derivatives except for medical and scientific purposes, a ban that continues to this day. In 1928, the UK banned cannabis altogether, and cannabis was banned in all 48 states by the mid-1930s, but remained in the U.S. pharmacopoeia. In 1937, the United States federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which effectively made cannabis unobtainable. But before it was passed, Dr. William C. Woodward, the American Medical Association's legal counsel, testified to the House Ways and Means Committee, quote, There are potentialities in the drug that should not be shut off by adverse legislation, the medical profession and pharmacologists should be left to develop the use of this drug as they see fit, end quote. Even with all this going on, in 1938, it was confirmed that scientists were able to isolate cannabinol by a team at the Lister Institute. The perception of cannabis changed during this time. It went from being a useful remedy to being viewed as a dangerous narcotic by the mid-20th century. Then, in 1942, though the American Medical Association pushed against it, Cannabis was removed from the U.S. pharmacopoeia and was only studied as a dangerous narcotic from World War II until the early 1960s. It was in the early 1960s when Israeli doctor Raphael Meshulam began studying CBD, which had previously been isolated in 1940, but no further research had been conducted. Building on his CBD research, Dr. Meshulam, along with Dr. Yeshael J. and I and their team, were able to isolate Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. This discovery led the team to seek the mechanism of action, but those receptors were not discovered until the late 1980s. This brings us to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is a complex regulatory system for functions like memory, digestion, motor function, immune response and inflammation, appetite, pain, blood pressure, bone growth, and the protection of neural tissue. Now, the endocannabinoid system is found in all complex animals, fish, dogs, cats, to humans. You've probably heard or seen of perhaps even yourself blown smoke onto your pet's face. And the belief behind this is that if it's good for me, this is good for my furry friend. However, high amounts of THC in animals can cause temporary paralysis, loss of bladder control, and disorientation in cats and dogs and rodents because they have significantly more CB1 receptors in their cerebellum, which regulates motor function. While it's likely that cannabis as medicine for animals has a lot of potential, high doses of THC are not recommended for all mammals. Our endocannabinoid system is comprised with three elements, endocannabinoid receptors, endocannabinoids which interact with those receptors, and enzymes that either synthesize or metabolize those endocannabinoids. There are two main types or two primary subtypes of endocannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. 
CB1 receptors are found throughout the brain, and when endocannabinoids attach and interact, it creates a type of circuit breaker that controls the release of inhibitory and executory neurotransmitters across the synapse. This is the receptor THC binds to mimicking one of our own endocannabinoids, anandamide, thus creating the psychoactive effect. The CB2 receptors are found in immune cells, blood cells, tonsils, the spleen, and key regions of the brain, such as the hippocampus. It has been seen regulating midbrain reward circuitry and in the hippocampus regulating self-activity and information flow within the brain's diverse networks. It does expand beyond these two receptors and include what are known as orphan CB receptors, which include GPR55, which some even call CB3 receptor, which is linked to energy homeostasis and metabolic dysregulation associated with diabetes and obesity. GPR18, which regulates multiple physiological functions that range from intraocular pressure to cellular migration and which include endometriosis and some forms of metastatic disease. GPR30 responds to estrogen with rapid signaling and GPR119, which functions as a fat sensor to reduce food intake and weight gain. There's also the transient receptor potential vanilloid type channel or TRPV1 the Caspian receptor, and it also interacts with cannabinoids and is involved with pain transmissions activated by temps over 109 degrees Fahrenheit, i.e. when you eat a hot pepper. There's also the PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma, which regulate metabolic functions like fatty acid storage, glucose, metabolism, and more. The discovery of the CB1 and CB2 receptors led scientists to seek out what naturally binds to them which leads to the discovery of the endocannabinoids anandamide and 2-AG in the early 1990s. Soon after that, the enzymes that degrade and metabolize these cannabinoids are also isolated. But before they can be metabolized, they first must be created. And to be created, there must be a precursor. Anandamide is synthesized from inarachidinoyl phosphatidylethanolamine, or NAEP, and enzymes including phospholipase A2, phospholipase C, and NAPDL. Once anandamide serves its purpose, it's metabolized by fatty acid amide hydrolose. Phospholipase C, or PLC, also plays a role in the production of the endocannabinoid 2-AG, along with diacylglycerol lipase. And once 2-AG has served its purpose, it's metabolized by monoacylglycerol. All endocannabinoids are synthesized from polyunsaturated fatty acids related to omega-3 fatty acids, so they are not water-soluble, meaning they do not travel through the body easily and thus are synthesized on demand and work locally. Now, I'm going to read a segment of the book, starting on page 36 and ending on the beginning of page 37. Quote, One local activity occurs when endocannabinoids serve as the primary messenger in retrograde signaling between neurons from the postsynaptic neuron back across the synapse to the presynaptic neuron, controlling the release of neurotransmitters across the synapse. In recent years, it has become increasingly clear that the role of endocannabinoids in this synaptic function is both more important and far more complex than was previously thought. Endocannabinoids effectively modulate the flow of neurotransmitters, keeping our nervous system running smoothly and are directly linked to the mechanisms underlying memory and learning. Endocannabinoids are produced on demand, released back across the synapse, activating the receptors and then taken up into the cells and then rapidly metabolized. Endocannabinoids appear to be profoundly connected with the concept of homeostasis, or maintaining physiological stability, and help to reduce specific imbalances presented by disease or injury. Endocannabinoids' role in pain signaling has led to the hypothesis that endocannabinoid levels may be responsible for the baseline of pain throughout the body, which is why cannabinoid-based medicines may be useful in treating conditions such as fibromyalgia. This could also mean that the constant release of the body's own endocannabinoids could have a tonic effect on muscle tightness or spasticity in multiple sclerosis, neuropathic pain, inflammation, and even baseline appetite. The value of proper endocannabinoid tone within the body appears to play a significant role in maintaining the general physiological and emotional well-being of a person. End quote. Cannabinoid-based medicines either enhance or interfere with our body's endocannabinoid system. Everyone is different. Biodiversity is real, and because cannabinoid receptors are found throughout the body, adding outside cannabinoids to treat one problem has the potential of throwing other issues out of proper functioning order. So not only should you use caution with cannabinoid medicines, but also only the minimum effective dose. That concludes this episode on the history of cannabis and the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. 
Once again, the book I used in preparation for this episode is called Cannabis Pharmacy, The Practical Guide to Medical Marijuana, the revised and updated version. It was written by Michael Backus, and Jack D. McCube, MD, was the medical editor. I cannot recommend this book enough to you. Get it. Read it. Ingest the information. Learn it. Know it. In order for cannabis to reach its fullest potential for humanity, the facts about this plant need to be more commonplace to the point of effectively squelching the myths that have been having a field day. And this book, Cannabis Pharmacy, is a great place to go to start your education. Again, we really stuck with just part one today, going into the historical context and the endocannabinoid system. But other chapters in part one include cannabis plant, how medical cannabis does and doesn't work, why cannabis works within the body, adverse effects of medical cannabis, phytocannabinoids, terpenoids, genotypes, phenotypes, and chemotypes. Part two is metabolizing medical cannabis, storing cannabis, cannabis contaminants, forms of cannabis, delivery and dosing, using medical cannabis in the workplace. Part three covers 50 varieties of cannabis. The type, the species, the breeding date, the genetics, the terpene profiles, similar varieties, availability, ease of cultivation, aroma, taste, potency, duration of effects, psychoactivity, analgesia, muscle relaxation, dissociation, stimulant, sedation. It really breaks down the strains. And then part four covers medical uses of cannabis, where it covers 50 diagnoses, where it covers the effectiveness, the historical uses, the proposed mechanisms, or how they believe it interacts with the body to effectively treat the ailment. It also gives dosage recommendations and suggested methods of ingestion. All right, we'll be back. I'd like to say next week, but it'll probably be two. See you then. If you would like to be a guest and share how cannabis has helped your health and wellness, contact us at considercannabisnow.com. If you found anything of value in this episode, please share it with someone else. Remember to subscribe for free and get every new episode delivered right to your phone. Join us next time as we consider cannabis together.